I would just start my presentation. When you um, are hungry and malnourished, they need dream and want tomorrow on destitution and hunger. Because you are not keeping the nutrition norm constant. Now I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, you, if you scratch your head, you will realize that what's called a rural reporter. But I see myself primarily as a reporter of the countryside. Uh, in about two weeks from now, I complete 25 years in my profession, out of which 12 years have been a, as a full-time rural reporter, which means I spend 270 days or more with the people I write about in the villages. I base myself with the communities I write about. And that's what I've done full-time for 12 years. Last year, I joined the Hindu. 11 years, I was a freelancer. Before that, I worked with a news agency. As you know, a, a journalist is not required to be a specialist in anything. We are generalists. It's not our job to play the fast bowling. It's our job to tell Ganguly how to play the fast bowling. You know, we're not dumb enough to go out and try doing it ourselves. Um, so s today, you can, in this one day, you can see me as the tail ender, coming to have a quick go at the bowling before allowing you all to get off to your coffee. Um, Exactly a year ago, the first hearing of the National Farmers Commission, which was set up after the elections by the new government, chaired by Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, was held in Chennai, September 1st, I mean just three days short of a year. Um, Dr. Swaminathan brought together an astonishing array of representatives of every sector that had anything to do with the countryside. This included farmers, landless laborers, bankers, lawyers, insurance officers, insurance uh, uh, give, uh, providers, government officials, high and low, ministers, including ministers of agriculture and finance, uh, journalists, scientists, agro-experts, economists, uh, statisticians, nutritionists, trade unionists, activists, non-governmental organizations, all under one, in one room. As you might expect, it was an extremely, extremely furious, angry and vicious debate that took place. Today, if you put farmers and bankers in the same room, you are essentially organizing a riot. Because that's how they feel towards, especially that's how farmers feel towards bankers. One of the central aspects of the rural crisis is the collapse of credit. It is gigantic. In fact, up to, up to 91, India followed from, this, from the Green Revolution period onwards the policy of social banking, which saw rural banking expand massively. Since 91, the total number of branches of bank, rural branches of banks has actually fallen in absolute terms and massively in percentage terms. It has fallen both in absolute terms and in percentage terms. Well, anyway, all these people were gathered there fighting very, very ferociously with each other. A lot of anger was being let off. And Dr. Swaminathan, who, apart from being a very intelligent man, is a great diplomat, calmly threw me to the wolves and said, Sainath will sum up and find a unity of purpose in all this. He told me, draw the strings together. Now, the only strings, all that I could see was that the strings were being drawn firmly around my neck. <laughs> we could barely keep people apart physically in the meeting and I was supposed to find a unity of purpose over there between what people were saying. Uh, there's an old saying that nothing focuses and concentrates the human mind more than the knowledge that its owner is to be hanged in the morning. So we actually found four areas of common ground between these different sections. From very different perspectives, from diametrically opposite positions, there were four things that were common in that meeting. One, everybody agreed without a doubt the rural economy had collapsed. There wasn't a single person in doubt on that issue, banker, farmer, insurance, whoever. Two, there was unanimity in that room across these sections that this collapse was not due to natural calamity. It was not due to drought or floods or other calamity. Those calamities made things a lot worse. They made the unbearable impossible. But they did not 
constitute the basis of the crisis. Third, so, third area of agreement was that the crisis was policy driven. Nobody had any differences over this. The bankers blamed the policies of the government which they felt forced them to extend credit where they didn't want to. The farmers saw in the same policies a, vi a, a viciousness towards their class, towards their interests. So even from very diametrically different positions, everybody agreed that it was a policy driven crisis. Fourth, um, anyway, before I come to the fourth, I would like to say that in my 25 years as a journalist and 12 years as a full-time rural reporter, I have never seen anything approaching the levels of rural distress as I have since 98-2000. It has been extraordinary, it's been heartbreaking and uh, really extremely worrying. Um, the collapse which, of which I'm talking goes far beyond agriculture. It is not the nature of agriculture, though it accounts for a much smaller share of your GDP today, since it employs 65% of your population in one way or the other, the nature of agriculture is that even if, it, even if, if agriculture does badly, everybody does badly. The carpenters do badly. When you look at the records of the starvation deaths, you will find in Andhra a number of carpenters have died of hunger deaths. Why? Because when agriculture ceases to have any, anything going for it for three years, no one orders a new plow. No one orders a re recycling of implements or tools. No one orders a new axe. No one makes a new bullock cart. The carpenter starves. So you'll find weavers, carpenters, their markets deprived by the collapse of agriculture, also being victims. Please don't imagine that this is a crisis of agriculture. It is an agrarian crisis. It involves all the sectors of rural society. Um, fourth, the fourth point which you can say on which some common ground was found, again from diametrically opposing perspectives. If we do not address the policy dimensions of this crisis, then it doesn't matter what good works, great works we do. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. If we do not address the policy dimensions, the, the sources that create this crisis, what we are then trying to do is to mop the floor dry with all the taps open and running. If we do not address that problem, we are not going to solve this crisis in the long run. I believe we can solve this crisis. But the mindset in which I think our society's elites are today is such, it reminds me of Walter Bagahot, the founding editor of The Economist, wrote of the rich of his time. He said, it is very difficult to explain hunger to the rich. I mean, we are talking about more than 180 years ago when he wrote, it is very difficult to explain hunger to the rich. How do you explain it to someone who asks you, why if you are hungry, don't you ring the bell and tell the butler what you want? It's very difficult to explain hunger to the Indian rich and to the Indian elite in the present time, including to the Indian media, whose performance, I will say without hesitation on this issue, has been despicable. Five, we have to locate these policies, we have to locate what is happening in a very major social and economic context. We have to locate it against the backdrop of the fastest growing inequality in Indian society since the colonial Raj. The gaps between the rich and the poor in this country have grown faster in the last 15 years than in the last 50. Every available measure of looking at inequality shows us this. Let me give you some examples. If you, this is a far cry, a far move away from the greater egalitarian vision that the freedom struggle, its legacy, its constitution gave us. Let me give you some measures of how you can look at this inequality before I give you snapshots from the countryside. If you take the United Nations Development Program, its Human Development Report has been published every year since 1991. Coincidentally, that's the year from which we start a whole slew of new policies. From 1991 to 2004, 2005, Every human development report of the United Nations shows you a worsening position of inequality in countries like India. At the period when we were all celebrating India shining, in those years, India's position in the Human Development Index, which rates the, ranks the quality of life in a country, India, from a pathetic position of 124, at a time when we were supposed to be doing brilliantly, sank to 127. That's the fact. That's one measure of how you were doing. What does being number 127 mean? 
Being number 127 means that in that survey, you were better off being a poor person in Botswana or the occupied territories of the Palestine than a poor Indian. This was not something to be proud of, but you never read about it in your media, though if you pick up the report of the UN, UN Human Development Report, you will see it for yourselves. This morning, friends, the Times of India, this morning, the international section of the Times of India, carries a report on the latest United Nations report, where the UN has named its entire report the, pre the inequality predicament. And it says one of the fastest growing gaps is the rural urban gap, especially in countries like China, India and Thailand. That's another measure that you can look at, though it says India's is less than China, and which may well be true. The report also shows us that 80% of the world's gross domestic product is now in the hands of less than 20% of the world's population, while the remaining 20% of the world's gross domestic product is shared by less than is, is shared by 5 billion people, 80% of the world's population. It says inequalities are stark and on the rise in some cases closely related to urban-rural gaps. Um, all these data are still scratching the surface. It's the mindset of inequality that worries me because when you debase human beings to such an extent, after a while you don't think of them as human beings. You know, whenever I come back to the cities from where I work in the villages, I'm now thinking, when, when, you, when, a, when a student joins medical college, they are told, medical students are told very early, what the mind does not know, the eye cannot observe. I would like to offer you a small amendment. What the heart does not feel, the eye will not see. The kind of gaps and disconnect, the biggest disconnect of our time is the disconnect between mass media on the one hand and mass reality on the other hand. There's a huge gap between what is going on in the countryside at the ground level and what we are looking at and what we are discussing in many forums, which is why this forum is such a welcome such a welcome one, and I congratulate the organizers for it. Let me quote for you from a report on inequality of income. This is the third measure I'm giving you. Abhijit Banerjee, who's a student of Amartya Sen, has done this study in Harvard for the Bread Group. I'm just quoting one paragraph. The share of the top 0.01, not 0.1, the share of the top 0.01% of the top 1% and the top 1% of total income rose, shrank very substantially from 1956 up to the reforms period, up to 90s. It shrank and then it began to rise. And then it rose so sharply that by year 2000, he is telling you, he and his collaborator Thomas Piketty, their Harvard, the paper from Harvard tells you, while in the 1980s, the gains were shared by everyone in the top 1%, the gains of the 1990s were mainly to those in the top 0.1% of the wealthy. That's how much of a gap has come between the super rich when a gentleman of Indian origin can hire the Versailles Palace at a cost of $240 million to hold his daughter's wedding. And by the way, that's seen as something quite heroic and you know, something to admire, it's glamorized in the media. In 19, let's move to the villages for a moment. In 1993, I took a bus ride I am privileged in the sense that I am a paid loafer. I, I have freedom to live in the village as I please. I get a salary for doing anything I wish in those 270 days. And it's a nice thing to happen. Though it's only happened for one year, and who knows how long it will last. I spent 50 to 60 days of my year as a migrant. Because I believe the only way I can write about migrants who form millions and millions of India's poor is to actually be a migrant. Therefore, I board the buses with them. And despite being terrified, I have boarded the tops of trains with them because that's how they travel since they can't afford tickets. In Mehboob Nagar, and those of you from Andhra Pradesh know of Mehboob Nagar district, it's poorest district. In 1993, I took a bus from Mehboob Nagar to Mumbai, where I live. I owe allegiance to several states. I'm a Telugu, born and brought up in Tamil Nadu, educated in the north, living in the west. The, the bus took 36 hours to Mumbai. We had to change two buses to reach Mumbai. On the bus were 40 or 50 landless Lambada Adivasis, singing songs and all of us going there as landless laborers looking for work in Mumbai, which is, by the way, where I live for the last 21 years. There was one bus a week from that bus depot in Mahabub Nagar to Mumbai. In 2003, friends, I made the same journey. This time, 
there were 47 buses a week. And I'm only counting government services. I'm not counting fly-by-night illegal operators who may be 20, 30, I don't know. But just government services had gone up to 47 buses a week from one depot. That's why I do these bus rides, because your data on migrations is nonsense. What the government of India gives you as migration data is over 10 years old. It does not capture the present picture. The definitions of migrant in the NSS and in the census do not capture the new situations they have come up. They count migration as a one-stop process from city A to city B, which is not the case. And they do not take into account short-term migrants or cyclical migrants or migrants who go out for very, very short, -term peri short periods of time. So millions of people are outside your data and we are still making policies on data that is more than 10 years old. Studies that came out 10 years ago on data maybe from the 80s. That's the, that, that is the extent of migration. Um, in 2003 when I took the same bus, the composition of the bus had changed. In 1993, it was just a bunch of Lambada Adivasis going for their landless, as landless laborers to Mumbai. In 2003, there were landed farmers with 12 acres and 15 acres on the bus. There were farm laborers. There were teachers who had lost their jobs. There were students thinking, let's go and work in Mumbai because they've dropped out. They couldn't afford to study any further. There were carpenters. There were mistries. There were weavers. There were mochis on the bus. One of the most poignant moments was looking at a 15-acre landlord making the journey in the bus and sitting next to him were his former bonded laborers. That day I wrote a piece, we are all in the same bus. Except for the privileged elite who live in the enclave cultures of the, two, of the year 2005. We are all in that same bus. Then, in also, when, by the way, I also figured out that the bus to Mumbai was no longer the bus to Mumbai. Mumbai is a generic term. A lot of those people went to Pune, Sangli, Kalyan, Thane, Panwel. The generic term, if you ask anybody, where are you going, they'll say Mumbai. But they were going to wherever the construction work was, wherever the work was, 15 days in Kalyan, 10 days in Panvel. What sort of a life is that? Where will the children of these people ever go to school, receive an education, or get access to decent health? A whole class of millions is perpetually condemned to be the rat in the scientist's maze, running up and down. What do their children have no rights? Do they have no rights? It's something we need to ask ourselves. The, is it only from Mahbub Nagar to Mumbai? No, sir. I've done more than 35 such routes. I'm going to tell you about two other routes. Let's take Mumbai. Mahbub Nagar agreed. It's a poor district. And it was 2003 when for the first time in living memory across Andhra Pradesh, thousands of food kitchens came up to give free gruel to people. The arrogance of the then Minister of Information, he stood up in the Andhra legislature and said, Mana Andhra Pradesh lo ganji Who in our Andhra Pradesh will eat ganji? The answer came when lakhs of people queued up. In Vepur village, in Kondapur village, in Mehbub Nagar, I photographed the sarpanch standing in the queue. That was the extent of hunger. The sarpanch was standing in the queue for free food. And incidentally, that particular free food center was run by four Telugu journalists. It, it defied comprehension. By the way, this was a year when we were boasting surplus food stocks and exporting food. At the height of the hunger that Utsa Patnaik described to you this morning, we exported 13 million tons of grain at a price lower than that of the below, below poverty line price. We exported grain at 5 rupees 45 pice per kilo while selling it to our poor people at 6 rupees 40 pice a kilo. What sense, what justice is there in that when you deny food at that price to your own people but export it to overseas markets? You're subsidizing the exporter and the overseas market but not the starving millions. Now, that day when we, got, when we saw the full scale of what was happening across AP, I wrote to the present editor of the Hindu. I ventured to predict a gigantic electoral defeat for Mr. Chandrababu Naidu who was then at the height of his popularity. And I predicted that it would be a defeat of proportions that would shock the rest of the country, but not any Telugu speaking person. Subsequently, as you know, that happened. Because when I told you that 8 acre and 12 acre people were traveling on the bus, we did in the National Farmers Commission, 
the farmers kisan the kisan sabha did a calculation which showed us that today in telangana you can own 8 acres of paddy land and be below the poverty line because of policies that have led to escalating food uh, input costs that have raised seed costs by 300 to 350% in many cases that have raised fertilizer costs by over 100% at the same time in a state which hiked utility rates by 70% water rates by 70% agriculture was made so uneconomic that you could own 8 acres and be below the official poverty line which itself as you know is a bit of a joke the social and cultural effects of this are as devastating as the economic effects in the country while while mr mittal holds his daughter's wedding in the versailles palace and while the elite of this city i don't know if any of you have ever attended in mumbai or delhi a theme wedding has anyone here attended a theme wedding a theme wedding is where a father spends 2 3 crores of rupees to create a replica of taj mahal or fatehpur sikri and gets his daughter married in that in the era of theme weddings weddings are collapsing in the countryside people are not able to afford weddings many of the farmers suicides are linked to the inability to get your daughter married many of these suicides have found have emerged from that crisis of the the wedding if you look at the church registers in wayanad in kerala you will show the church registers because there you have a registered wedding i mean it's registered by the church declined between 2002 and 2004 by 50% the church collections on sunday are 10% of what they were 5 years ago and that is the richest district of kerala it is not wayanad unlike mehboob nagar is not a poor district it's a cash crop district that was earning 1500 to 1800 crores of rupees in foreign exchange for this country by the export of cash by the export of coffee by the export of pepper again undone and destroyed by policy including our trade liberalization policy including our agreements with the WTO that have completely destroyed the coffee growers in april this year coffee prices began to boom in london indeed they'd been high even last year in november So you have this peculiar situation that coffee prices are booming in London and coffee farmers are committing suicide in Karnataka and in Kerala. How does that happen? Where does the money go? In 1992, the world coffee market was worth 30 billion dollars, and the producer countries, which is us, were getting 10 billion dollars or one third of the total. Today, the world coffee market has doubled. It's 60 billion dollars. We get less than six billion dollars out of it. the whole third world the producers get something has happened resources have been taken away the crisis in the countryside is not due to drought or famine or anything of the sort in 1991 development expenditure in this country accounted for 14 and a half percent of our gross domestic product last year it accounted for 5.9 percent that is a fall of 30000 crores now if you remove 30000 crores from the countryside that translates into an income loss of between 120000 crores and 150000 crores which society in the world would not have a crisis if you removed 34 billion dollars from it that those cuts in expenditure were the basis of a whole bunch of processes that went spiraling i took the bus from manantawadi those of you who are from kerala will know sultan bateri and manantawadi in wayanad district in 1991 sir the ksrtc did not have a bus service to kutta In 1995, six buses a day went to Kutta. Today, 28 buses a day are going to Kutta. Wayanad was the only district of Kerala known for in-migration, not out-migration. It was a rich district, therefore people came from central Kerala. They came from Travancore. They settled there on Adivasi land. They became the small farmers of that, the prosperous farmers of that area. They make the best pepper in the world, Malabar pepper, for which Vasco da Gama sailed across the oceans and also acquired a colony alongside. but the malabar pepper which is the best pepper the premium grade pepper in the world you can get onto the net today and go to the multi commodity stock exchanges of the world and check malabar pepper is the premium grade because of the policies we have adopted malabar pepper pepper is being destroyed by cheap pepper dumped in kerala from vietnam indonesia nicaragua sri lanka and other places remixed with malabar pepper and sent out as indian pepper to western markets it's killing the pepper farmers of malabar it is also endangering the quality of the seed because that has now entering the food chain the inferior the lower grade pepper qualities are now entering the food chain and therefore you've had pepper diseases you've had slow wilt you've had all kinds of problems with it in uh, when i took the bus uh, in kerala again 
the composition was very different there were teachers there were engineers there were carpenters there were students the saddest part though she is now a celebrity and her education is paid for the distance between kutta and manantawadi is 40 kilometers each way there was a the youngest commuter traveling alone with only uh, older students to look after her was 5 year old anushri attending first class because the keralites have great faith in their own education system though they have been driven across the border to work as landless laborers in karnataka every day she boards a bus in kutta and goes to manantawadi to study in the malayalam medium school and goes back in the evening crossing the state border twice which means we have reduced a 5 year old to traveling 400 kilometers a week to attend school at a time when we are raising bus fares by 60% in that area where is the justice of it i mean it's baffling that there is no shortage of resources when it comes to giving huge handouts to the rich whether it's in mill lands or anything else anything we give the rich is an incentive anything you give the poor is a subsidy this is the language you can give billions of rupees to the rich that's an incentive mr pawar now the, the, the you know the, the the genius of all incentive givers is now giving himself an incentive he is one of the biggest you know interests in wine he now wants to promote wine as a food in his own state in vidarbha very large numbers of farmers have committed suicide they are cotton growers mainly though all farmers are now affected it's not just cotton growers it's not just cane growers every section paddy farmers that crisis has spread beyond the original cotton farmer thing but vidarbha is important because the discrimination within the state of maharashtra the the tariff the duties for import of sugar are just 5% and raised to 10% this year after much protest but the duties that protect sugar which mr pawar represents is 60% okay why is it you know far poorer farmers are dependent on cotton than on sugar far poorer farmers 30 lakh people are dependent on the cotton growing of vidar then in the same period we have raised the input cost raised the fertilizer cost and denied people credit at a moment when every input cost ammonia phosphate dpa you know you take one bag used to cost 120 rupees in 1991 it cost 480 to 520 rupees now take a take a bag of seeds which used to cost 60 rupees 70 rupees now it costs for 450 grams it costs 600 rupees 700 rupees the deregulation of agriculture was a conscious policy that allowed manufacturers to downgrade the quality of what they give some of you here may have a farming background you know that when you pick up a packet of seed you have to give it is a legal requirement it is a legal requirement that you write minimum germination rate of the seed in the 70s and 80s the minimum germination rate was about 80% it was even 90% mr naidu then signed mous with multinationals that has now become the that has become the mode across the country the germination rate required now is 60% You know what that means? It means that if you, as a village, buy thousand bags of seed, you pay for thousand bags, but you get six hundred bags. Hmm? Where is the justice in that? And by the way, those seeds now, some of these fake seeds have been banned in AP. They've developed, they've sprouted legs and run across the border into Vidarbha, which is next door to Telangana. So Vidarbha is full of fake seeds. Their crisis, their 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 misery is intense. The policies towards pepper and coffee meant that coffee growers. who were getting 130 kg 130 rupees per kg in 1992 93 now you're getting 15 to 16 rupees per kg for the cherry at a time when prices are doing very well they're not doing badly what is the commitment of government to reversing this i went to the coffee board to find out 16 coffee farmers had committed suicide in that one year in the in the months that prior to when i had come there in that year i go to the coffee board of wayanad they welcome me very warmly and offer me a cup of tea in the coffee board this is their commitment to promoting coffee the coffee board offers me a cup of tea i said listen this is blasphemy i mean this is beef in the temple i mean you 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 are offering me you are the supposed to be the sole custodians of the promotion of coffee they said ah but the filter is broken sir okay so the filter was broken the um, the pepper which was fetching 27000 rupees per quintal in 9 in 98 2000 is now getting 5000 rupees per quintal do you know one of the major casualties of this interestingly is the church because in kerala the church is a land owner many of the churches have gone bankrupt because they used to own lot of pepper uh, plantations they used to own whole stretches of pepper like the catholic church of malankara church in bayanar has suffered seriously financially the church class base 
are poor small farmers. They have gone completely bankrupt. And no credit, no credit. Do you know what it feels like to look at a suicide? By the way, I'm not going to get into the numbers game on the suicide, though I can tell you thousands and we can discuss it when you want to. Because there are seven ways. I, I would like to say that thanks to the Maharashtra courts pressing the government of Maharashtra, it has been placed on the defensive on this issue. It is forced to come out with, it's forced to be a little more forthcoming. It is still not telling you the truth, sir. They are lying through their teeth on the numbers and I can prove it to you. However, the much more important thing is the human dimension of what is happening. The, imagine that I go, I have, I have since 2000 visited between 300 and 350 households where suicides have taken place in different states of this country. It has killed me. You know, when you look at a death that need not have occurred, that somebody need not have taken their life, and it has still happened. That's when I said I offer you the amendment. What the heart does not feel, the eye will not see. A, a farmer kills himself, he is sure to get his crop. He wants a crop loan of 8,000 rupees. What is 8,000 rupees? What is 8,000 rupees? He has denied that unless he will take it at rates of interest between 14.5% and 18%. You know what our banks are doing? They are converting non-agricultural loans into agricultural loans and giving it to you at the rates of non-agricultural loans. So if you buy a tractor today, you will pay 18% for a tractor and then I, as an urban middle class professional, go back to Bombay and get an offer from the same banking system, buy a Mercedes Benz at 6% rate of interest without collateral. Is there any justice in that world? You can buy, they're, they're, I get these, you also get these every week in your mail, some rubbish credit card invitation. Buy a Mercedes Benz without collateral at 6% rate of interest. When a guy has killed himself because he could not get 8,000 rupees of a crop loan at the correct time that he needed it. The minimum support price mechanisms are in a mess. Unless you are a very rich farmer. Not if, not if you belong to the poorer people. A slew, a slew of policies. Um, um, <laughs> the inequality shows in other ways. The great, one of the greatest crises of agriculture and the agrarian societies is water. And this country is firmly moving on the path of privatization of water, which will cause a civil war in your countryside. This has been a natural resource, a God-given resource. People have always utilized it according to the rainfall. We are privatizing rainfall in that sense. In that sense, that's what we're doing. When I went to Vidarbha in May, in, in May, June, in May, June, whole of May and June rather, in the Nagpur rural, there is a town called Bazar Gaon. It is a town which also made news for getting water once in 10 days and once in 15 days. But when I went, it had situation, they told me, had improved greatly. They were getting water once in five days. So the situation had improved threefold. In the same village of Bazar Gaon is a gigantic water amusement park using millions of liters of water per day. And all that it pays to the panchayat of the village is 50,000 rupees, which is less than half of what it earns in the entry ticket daily. Because it's owned by prominent rich politicians. And by the way, it's owned by a Delhi group and set up in collaboration. It's owned by a Delhi group, the Fun, Fun and Food Village group. And they have set it up by buying the local politicians in the Vidhar. Okay? They are, the village is getting less than half of one day's, in a whole year it is getting less than half of what the entry ticket earns in one day. Where is the justice in it that the children of Bazar Gaon die without water, but the rich classes can play and frolic in the water amusement park that specializes in 18 kinds of water slides and has India's only snow dome imported from Japan where they keep snow perpetually. Incidentally, do you remember the Maharashtra power crisis of May? In this park, a whole of Vidar, in this water amusement park, no bulb was switched off at any time during that crisis. Bazar Gaon went without electricity for two weeks, but not the fun and amusement part. It is a curious idea to me of fun and amusement. Uh, a slew of policies, therefore, have, con have converged to privilege corporate profit. A slew of policies have converged to privilege, cor privilege corporate profit over public well-being. Indeed, um, you know, I, the water privatization that they are considering will consider, if you look at the Maharashtra Water Resources Regulatory Authority Bill, which got passed and which more than 20 MLAs told me we didn't read it. They just said pass it. It's a very good pro-farmer measure. We passed it. 
okay now that will will explode the costs of agriculture and you will see more people leaving the farms and coming to mumbai because it will make agriculture totally unviable mr naidu did this in 1997 when he shut down the industry when he shut down the irrigation development corporation of andhra pradesh the result of the shutting down of the irrigation development corporation was that everybody everybody started sinking more and more bore wells and took much money to go to to sink in bore wells the result of this was that a village of 3000 people called mushampalli in nalagonda district of andhra pradesh the village has a population of 3000 it has 6500 bore wells more than two bore now the aquifer of the entire region is destroyed this crisis is spreading the bore wells have arrived in vidar the bore wells have arrived in kerala i'm not going to take much more of your time but i'm trying to say that please remember that whatever is happening has to be looked against the inequality matrix the matrix of our inequality because that is going to fuel the social turmoil and discontent on a scale that we will not believe farming is now gambling it is the russian rule you know the russian soldiers used to play in world war 2 one bullet in the gun you switch it put it to your head if you're lucky it doesn't it doesn't go through your brain it's called russian rule farming is today russian rule you sow too soon you have a drought you sow twice you have extra doubled input costs sometimes you get floods and it gets wiped out it's become an extreme gamble for a lot of people but it's not just that the same communities are hurt by the commercialization of just about everything health costs have gone up education costs have gone up travel costs have gone up we are talking about 260 million people in the country whom the government of india admits are poor they, that is the official admission for these people all these prices have gone up in for, for hundreds of millions of indians globalization sir has been the globalization of prices the indianization of incomes they are also citizens they also have rights they are not in subhuman you know when when the tsunami struck in the co- in the coast of tamil nadu in the district of nagapattinam the worst affected district was nagapattinam you can read the collectors website 30000 houses were destroyed in nagapattinam by the tsunami in the same period government of maharashtra destroyed 84000 houses in mumbai it was not considered at all a bad thing by many something has gone wrong somewhere we've lost our way around what the rights of a human being are somewhere i think the, those powerful ones amongst us have lost their way the the uh, incidentally after the tsunami struck this is a worldwide phenomenon the five worst countries affected by the funa- tsunami the five worst countries india indonesia thailand sri lanka malaysia i mean the, 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 these are the five countries which have big stock exchanges in every one of these countries the stock exchange reached its highest at historic point ever the point i'm trying to make to you is there is a very real link between the prosperity of the few and the penury of the many it's a link that is more and more driving policy the market has every say in the formulation of government policy i think that's anti democratic the confederation of indian industries tells you that less than 1.15% of indian households have any investments how can they have a much greater say that can reverse the mandate of the public say in the 2004 elections something has gone very very seriously wrong now about the suicide numbers and i, I want to draw this to a close with that we will never know how many suicides took place in andhra pradesh first whoever tells you they have the numbers don't believe it we know and we can show you that the government numbers are false and at least because there was a, a regime change in andhra pradesh some of the more real figures have come out the government of andhra pradesh no longer denies that 3000 suicides occurred in the rayalaseema region more than 2000 of them in the anantapur district alone so if you start applying this logic elsewhere let me give you i mean i don't need to tell a you know a gathering of legal luminaries how many ways there are of excluding people from a categorization you heard it this morning about below poverty line let me give you three categorizations in suicides where thousands have been excluded starting with maharashtra let me give you what do you know when the suicide takes place the talati goes with a list of 43 indicators that the have and that suicide has to meet 43 conditions in yavatmal they told me now we cannot even commit suicide in peace we have to read their indicators otherwise our family will re- receive no help you know what are the indicators bank loan they only count nationalized bank loan 
they do not count the money lenders loan therefore 90% of vidarbha suicides are going to be excluded from the list because they are never going to get bank loans all their money is from private lender they are excluded the, but the biggest one of the biggest sources of exclusion is the exclusion of women suicides it happened in andhra in a very big way the woman is not considered a farmer there is no land in her name so if she commits suicide due to the stress of running the family because the husband has migrated to mumbai it is not a farmer's suicide it is a farmer's wife's suicide she is running the farm she is conducting the operations she is sending the children to school but she is not a farmer in indian society now the same measure has affected hundreds of households in maharashtra sir by a very simple method typically you know that old people in an indian household keep the land in their name to the very last moment because they don't want fragmentation of the land and because it's an insurance i don't want to be thrown off the land by my sons so people old people keep the land in their name till the very last minute now what happens uh, i am a farmer let us say aged 75 my son is aged 48 he is running the farm the stress is on him i have not done any work in 20 years because i'm physically unfit the stress is on him he kills himself it is not regist- it is registered as a suicide it is not counted as a farmer's suicide because he is not a farmer there is no land in his name the land is in my name you know your society as well as i do can you imagine how many people that would exclude the working farmer commits suicide but the land is in the father's name so no compensation can also be given to those families because it is not a farmer who has committed suicide women are excluded in this fashion people in whose name the land is not are included in this excluded in this fashion and the greatest exclusion of all took place in anantapur which our investigation took 6 months to uncover we found that the government was stating a very high number of suicides they were not the total number of suicides in the district crime records bureau was indeed very high it was not low but the number of distress suicides what they characterized as distress suicides by farmers was a minuscule figure and we found that 90% of the suicides were of the same modus i mean they had consumed a pesticide called monocrotophos produced by siba gage why monocrotophos because that's the only free agricultural input it was dumped by the state government through on behest of the corporation now you know how the police recorded these suicides the pesticide linked suicides i mean since i don't know if you are even going to believe this but we have the proof of it they recorded it as death suicide due to acute stomach ache kadupunoppi pottanoppi this is written in the police record anyone who takes pesticide is going to have a very bad stomach ache that we know that is guaranteed hundreds of suicides were recorded as suicide due to unbar the victim had an unbearable stomach ache therefore unable to cope with it he drank pesticide it was the pesticide that gave him the stomach ache so i could go on like this it needs a separate session i'm not going to i'm going to close here but the exclusion of these figures means that the data is corrupt instead of trying to fix a particular figure let's look at the human side of what is happening there is acute distress in the countryside the suicides tragic as they are and i have lived with 350 of them are still only a symptom of a much larger distress they are only a symptom not the cause not the out, not the process of a much of a much larger rural and agrarian distress the policies that brought that out and look the policies that brought that about included the cuts in development expenditure from 1991 the collapse of rural credit at a time when prices were going up the water policies of this government are going to be the biggest war field battlefield of contention in our society in the next few years investment in agriculture as professor patnaik e- explained to you fell below by the way it was food in food production it was the growth rate of food production that suffered very very severely the growth rate of food production in the dynamic 90s was about 1.2 to 1.3% uh, dr manmohan singh said the, and even montek singh said in the last two months in the stagnant 80s it was 3.54% the annual average growth rate of output in agriculture the soaring input costs were another part of the crisis soaring commercialization of education that really put a lot of pressure on poor people causing the farms to withdraw their children from schools global commodity prices against which we have removed a lot of protections for our farmers while the united states and the european union introduce ever more protection for their farm producers hmm? and uh, all these the collapse of social banking the idea that banks have a responsibility towards society all these came together in the 90s to kind of co- to cause some of the distress for me the saddest part is in my own profession 
I think we can describe the process which I'm talking about as the predatory commercialization of the countryside. Yeah. The predatory commercialization of the countryside. All human value has been converted into exchange value. People have to pay for things that they never paid for. People who have lived off livelihoods based on exchange can no longer do so. I would like to leave you with this, that in my own profession, and it shows you how seriously we are taking this crisis. Agriculture affects 650 million people in this country. I did a check in 2003 and I've been doing this check every year since then. How many people went out and covered the crisis at its worst from the so-called national media? I did a check, I rang up my friends who are editors, owners of channels, newspapers, and I asked, don't tell me how many people you sent, tell me how many people you sent who spent one full week, seven days in the countryside. Total number I could get was six. The biggest agrarian crisis since the Green Revolution, total number of national journalists spending one week in the countryside, six. Total number of journalists covering LACME India Fashion Week in Delhi, 412 accredited journalists plus 100 journalists with daily passes. Something has gone seriously wrong. I leave you to reflect on it. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. 